escape the nine to five and create your path to freedom. Welcome to the Corporate Escape Stories. These are episodes where I interview inspiring people that have left their nine to five jobs to create freedom-based businesses that support them in living the life they want. I am Lydia Lee. I'm a reinvention coach and freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle. If you are new here, don't forget to hit the subscribe and the notification bell button to be the first to know when every new video comes out on the channel. I can't wait for you today to meet my guest, Adi Cohen. So to the best of Adi's knowledge, she may just be the first architect to be living a nomadic lifestyle while working with clients uh, globally. Uh, She's the founder of The New Movement, an architecture studio that designs one-of-a-kind projects worldwide. So traditionally, it may be hard to imagine how to be an architect without being physically in a space with clients. So this is really what I wanted to find out from Adi's story and what really instigated that inspiration for her to reinvent her work, right? And do things differently. So I think you're going to really enjoy this interview, uh, specifically on the thought process and the mindset shifts that Adi had to do uh, to align her business with her lifestyle choices. I think you'll be very inspired by her story and I can't wait for you to watch it. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Today, this is my guest, Adi Cohen. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me on the show. It's so much fun. And we have definitely met virtually like this previously. And I just remember going, twinsy souls. We are cut from the same cloth. (laughs) And I said, Adi, you need to come on board and we need to share your story because it was so inspiring to me. And I think a lot of the, um, yeah, what we're going to be talking about today is is going to help empower a lot of people that think, um, you know, how do I do a traditional career that's not been done in this form before? (laughs) Being a nomadic architect, for example. Um, So (laughs) thank you for taking time to share with us today. Of course, it's my pleasure. I always wanted to experience the feeling of being in different places. Walking down the streets, breathing in the atmosphere, touching the textures. All those things you can never really discover through photographs. Buildings are made for people, and people respond to their environment. Traveling the world, I get to experience firsthand all sorts of structures. And those experiences are an endless source of inspiration and insight. Okay, so I like to always start um, these interviews with a question uh, that is about really your history um, and about your family and how your identity has been shifted from it. So um, what what do you think, like, how is your family, um, you know, background, cultural background has shaped your identity and how has that changed since you've kind of moved into adulthood? Hmm. Such an interesting question. Mm, (laughs) I love it. Um, Let's say, okay, so in my family, we have like these two forces, right? So my father is the, he's the one who's like, has a steady job for the past 40 years. He's going to the same office every day, doing the same kind of work, very consistent. And my mom, she's this free spirit, yoga enthusiast, um, vegan person who's always like looking for the next adventure. So I think in a way I'm uh, this mix between these two characters because I do Mm. have that hardworking attitude of coming from my father's side. And my mom always, you know, we used to, when it was raining, my mom would be like, oh, let's go dancing in the rain barefoot. And it's like, okay. I love your mom already. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. She's she's this really amazing person. Uh, so I think having these two in my background uh, kind of like encouraged me to, yeah, to see that, that there's more than one way of doing things because they're both very good examples of, you know, <laughs> adulthood that seems radically different from one another. <laughs> Yeah. And do you think that that, you know, like, did you follow, you know, your, your father's footstep more? Or did you think your mother was a bigger influence for you? Was there like any, any sort of conflict or battles with either parent when you kind of decided to take your leap into, into a a different type of path? That's a different trajectory for what, from what they believe is the right way to to do things. Yeah, I think it's it's so interesting. I never thought about it. Thank you for making me, you know, dig deep into the (laughs) questions today. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like therapy, right? So listen, when I was a young girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I think I'm always kind of like going between these two. Like growing up, I always knew that I don't want to have a standard life, right? Mm. I, 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 when I was 18, I went to India. And then when I came back, I remember myself sitting on a, on a hill overlooking the traffic in my city where I grew up and just <clears throat> sorry seeing all the all the people like rushing rushing going to work and back and then like I it just seems so meaningless to me mm. and I said I don't want to be part of it but actually I had no idea how to to create it any other way um, so then I had a few years when I was traveling which I guess I was more connected to my mother's side, you know, going one way and exploring. But at that time, I was not an architect. I was just me traveling around, exploring different cultures and really enjoying it. And after a while, I just felt like I had, I felt like my hands are itchy. You know, I had all this energy. And I was like, oh, I want, I want to do something. I want to create something, but I don't know what. And I went back to Israel, um, started working in, with this artist, and I kept thinking like, what do I want to do? What do I want to create? Um, and then I, I kind of realized that architecture would be a really good fit for me because I love spaces and the way that they, they kind of like hold people, the way that, that a space can really change your mood or um, just, you know, have a different mindset. So I went back to Israel and I was like, um, daddy, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to architecture school. And he was like, he told me that years later, but at the time he was like, he was very suspicious <laughs> of me, uh, you know, fitting into the architectural lifestyle and, and being uh, in university because it's five years of studying in Israel. Mm. Uh, very hard. Like you barely have time to work. You're like, you never sleep and you're the time busy, busy, busy running on like working on the next project and always deadlines of the deadlines. And I loved it. Mm. and yeah so then when I graduated architecture I started working in a firm and that looked like more my father's uh, influence but then it was so clear that I can't <laughs> I, I can't do this for 40 years I don't know how people do it and it made me really question myself in a way it's like what's wrong with me am I not hard working like why am I not enjoying this, right? I did the, um, I don't know if I'm going too far in the story right away, but it just felt like, you know, you you check all the boxes on the adult list. Mm. And it's just like, okay, so I have this great job and I'm working here and I say, like, I should be happy. I should be satisfied, but there's something about the routine um, that that doesn't, you know, there's something about my soul that needs more than this just mm. knowing how tomorrow is going to look like it's so depressing for me <laughs> <laughs> and I think you know what I'm talking about because you used to be the same definitely and and in a lot of ways it took me a lot longer to take my leap I don't know how long it took you but I, I come from the reason why I love asking that question about family history and tradition and culture mm. is because there, there, there is a big influence on that on our identities and what we believe is our identities that's passed on by our parents right about what we believe is true mm. um, my parents come from Malaysia Penang a really beautiful island in Malaysia and we moved and migrated to Canada at uh, a really at a really young age for me at about nine years old but it took me a long time to leave corporate because I always felt this, I don't know if it's just an Asian family thing or maybe Israeli families have, have this as well. Uh, but there's a sense of like a shame, you know, it's like they gave up so much for me to get uh, be having an opportunity in a first world country. Um, none of my family has this opportunity that are back in Malaysia, you know, and I have to make something of myself. And if I climb that corporate ladder and I've reached this status of privilege and prestige, I have to hold on to it like it's I'll never get it again. <laughs> Because that was the narrative that was given to me by my mother, who worked very hard to be at a big corporation for 35 years. She just uh, retired a couple years ago, right? But that was her, 
I mean, in her times, this was the right thing to do is actually to stay the course, right? And climb that corporate ladder. Whereas in my life, and this is sort of the moment you had too, which is like, I'm not quite sure if I could do this or if I have to even be doing it this way. Um, but my my questioning of that, of that came only after I had a mental breakdown, only after when I had a health scare. So I, I wish I could say I had a Gandhi moment <laughs> of just like, Whoa! you know, like the, 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 the stars just shone and I'm like, I need to go after my freedom. No, that that was not how it happened. I did not didn't think at all. My, my mind was so narrow about what I thought was possible. But that health scare woke me up to that, I may not know what I want, but I definitely know this isn't what I want. <laughs> if, if that makes sense to you too. Yeah. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I didn't know that I'm going to be a nomadic architect. I actually had to um, give up the idea of being an architect in order to leave and start my journey. Um, hmm. Well, let's talk about that because that is such, such a, an interesting career, right? And I think best to your knowledge, as you've said to me, is that you might be the world's first nomadic architect. And you <laughs> yeah. know, any other architects that find this video, let us know if she is not the only one and we can join the club uh, or you can join the club <laughs> with them. Uh, but that is a very traditional career in a sense of that, you know, when you think about uh, services and right, th that that sort of career focus um, is not something that you could, you would immediately think, I can make this into remote, remote work. I can design for clients that are not in the physical space I'm in, right? Um, and my mind, because I'm a practical person, thinks about things like <laughs> regulations and, you know, um, how are you designing for the re regulations for each type of city and zoning laws and so forth. And um, I'm sure most people will think about that and get really scared about even, you know, entertaining that idea because it feels like a lot of work <laughs> to get it to that point. <laughs> um, but I kind of want to know your story on when, when was this moment, what happened in your life that instigated this feeling that I'm, I'm going to take this risk to explore an alternative way to do this thing called architecture, even though it's never, I don't know anyone that wants to do it the way I'm going to do it. Like what, what happened and what did you do to find out that this was a possibility for you? Sure. Um, so, okay, what happened? A few things happened, like not a, a mental uh, crisis, but uh, me and my partner, uh, we broke up mm -hmm. and I moved to a different city in Israel. And at, at the time I was working at the firm and um, my partner, the architect there was, uh, you know, I, I was about to quit. And he said, you know what? I know you work remotely, like, it's not a problem. Just come like every one or two weeks to the office and we'll have meetings, but you know, work from home. No, no problem at all. So for a few months, this is what I did. And then um, a good friend of mine who used to be my mentor, uh, used to be one of my professors actually in architecture university, uh, passed away um, because of cancer. And I just flipped. <laughs> you know? mm. I just felt like, um what's the point you know because uh, his name is Ilan so we used to sit for hours and talk about my wish to be to be to physically be in different places in the world and uh, he always used to tell me like you know but why why what's so interesting about it why, why do you want to do it like I don't know I just want to just want to physically be in so many places and he he, he he I think is like the one person who I could talk to about it and it didn't think that I'm crazy or like something is extremely wrong with me um, because this is like not the rational thing to do, right? Um, so then when he passed away, I just thought to myself, you know what? Um, like, it seems like my life is falling apart. It mm -hmm. feels like this earthquake is happening and nothing is stable anymore. And this is the moment where I'm allowed to go crazy. <laughs> like now... I can do whatever I want because you know what? Nothing makes sense. And I just knew what I don't want, like how I don't want my life to look like. It's mm. like exactly like you said, you know, it's like, you know, working nine to five or eight to six, you know, because it's never nine to five um, in the same place every day. Um, I don't know if you know about that, about architecture. It seems like it sounds so creative, but actually the day to day work when you're practicing it, it's a lot of, bureaucracy, drawings, technicality. And I just felt like I'm living on 10% on, on all the time. And, and maybe 
maybe I have more. Is it possible that I have more than 10% in me? And how would that feel like living on like closer to 100 or 80 or 90? Um, so then I decided to sell my stuff and go on a one-way ticket journey just to places that I always wanted to be in. Um, and everyone around me thought that I'm crazy. <laughs> they, I, okay, my father and my mother, again, my father was like, you're throwing your life away. Uh, you you know, and I just got the, the, the new project to design his synagogue. And he was like, what are you doing? You know, it's like, this is everything you ever wanted. We always make, make jokes about it. Uh, when I was a student that one day I will design his synagogue. And then it happened and I'm, I'm running away, but I was not running away. I was just like, listen, I need to, to take some time, some distance and figure out what I want to do because this is not it. Um, so at the time I had a few projects in Israel and I was lucky enough to have partners that helped me to take care of it remotely, right? So I had partners here, they would go to meetings with the clients, to go to the city hall um, to do the appointments and I would do the design or some drawings remotely. Um, so that was a good deal. <laughs> it was. And I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so for a while I was really kind of like taking this leap of faith into the unknown, into just, you know, let's see what happens. Maybe I'm not an architect anymore. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll find, I don't know, a factory in China and take the leftovers and create something new. And it's like, I have so many ideas. I was like, I had to really go into this process of kind of like detaching from my identity as an architect because it was painful. You know, it was five years in university and then another six years of internship. It's a lot of time, energy and money that you don't want to kind of like throw away. Um, yeah, but and it's I, a lot of commitment to a craft and it's, it's not easy to just say goodbye to it. And maybe we, we don't need to say complete goodbye like or throw the baby out of the bathwater, so to speak, right? But it's sort of reinventing yeah. how we do that differently, perhaps. Yeah, I think I had to do it because if I would still, you know, hold on to the idea of being an architect, I would never go on this journey. I would just go to a different firm or, you know, go and do an internship somewhere abroad. Um, but that understanding, um, you know, just have the freedom to explore for a few months, for a few years. Going did, in, did, in did that did that mean that you you after you had that project with the, with the synagogue and your partners that luckily went to do a lot of the meetings for you so that you could kind of work from home and get your bearings down and when you started to travel did you did you take a pause on being an architect to kind of rediscover who you were through travel or did you continue to work on those projects uh, that you started with in Israel? Yeah, so I I did both. So I mm. I, I you know. I have to, you know, when I'm committing to something, I do it all the way. Um, the the first place I went to was Japan. Mm. And one of my favorite things to do there was getting lost on purpose, which means just, you know, you choose a spot, you go there and you wander around for hours and it's so magical. <laughs> and oh yeah, Japan is amazing. And, you know, I, I, I was obsessed with the traditional Japanese houses. For some reason, I just found it fascinating the way that the, the house and the garden are like integrated into one and like the woodwork is incredible and the details. And I kept asking myself, so I went to like, I don't know, 50 different Japanese houses and I took pictures and I had the plans and I was like, why are you doing this? Adi? You don't want to be an architect anymore. Why are you obsessed about like Japanese houses? But... <laughs> But I decided I'm going to just go with my, you know, intuition. And if something is interesting for me, I'm just going to go for it. So, mm. yeah, this is interesting for me. I'll go for it. And then the next thing and the next thing. And obviously this and that. So you asked about uh, how does it work, right? Like, do I have to do, do you know the regulations or things like that? Yeah, you know, so so like my, my curiosity is going to like ask to continue traveling and to be a nomadic architect. What were some of the things that you had to do to prepare yourself and prepare your clients? Because not every 
uh, you know, my my brain goes to what if people don't want to work with an architect that isn't in their city, right? That's in their um, vicinity, right? Of that they can see and go and see locations with and uh, designs with, right? How did you sort of yeah. manage to? Well, a did it mean that you had to find specific clients that would be all right for this? Um, how did you get started in finding your first clients for you know your your business and and how did you have to enroll them into this new way of architecting, if that's a word? <laughs> <laughs> and trust and trust that you're going to get the job not. done, right? <laughs> you know, how did you get that sort of going for yourself? Yeah. Um, so like every good things, it happens by, by, I would say by, by accident, but it's not, it's just like, it just happened. So what happened is that I met a couple who had just bought a hotel in Japan and we were in like in the mountains in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and they were <clears throat> sorry and they were so happy to learn that I'm an architect and they asked me to do a consulting session for their hotel and I couldn't understand why you know because Japan has so many amazing architects but um and this is what I learned after a while uh that most of my clients are global citizens or they see themselves as ones like people that live you know, in places like expats, digital nomads, just people who explore beyond their home country. And when they're looking for an architect, when they fall in love with a place and want to start a project, or if they want to do a business idea, then looking for, they're looking for an architect that, say, that has the same mindset, that they, they can understand, like, what does it mean to come from a different culture? What do, like, how do I mix my identity and this local culture and, and how, what, what is the best way of doing so? And a lot of the time, the local architects are not really familiar with this global mindset. And this is where I fit in. But it took me a while to, to, to understand that. Yeah. I Like every time somebody, you know, approached me with a project, I couldn't understand why they need me. It's like, there are so many architects. I'm just this random girl from Israel, right? Okay, I, maybe. And at the time, I didn't even have a website. They would just hire me based on my, of, you know, having, having a conversation, which is extremely unusual. Um, well, I mean, that is, that is in itself a, a, you are, you are the brand, you are the person. So I think meeting you is probably better than looking at a website. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, I and, and, so. and I, and I love that, you know, your story starts with just, you have this passion, you were open to meeting people. You didn't know in the beginning that your target market was going to be digital nomads. I mean, you, that term just, I didn't even know what that was until I was doing it. And someone said, you are a digital nomad. And I had to be like, what's that? <laughs> um, and then found out that was like a trending hashtag. Uh, but you know, this is many <laughs> years ago, but, um, uh, that that that's I think some of the, uh, one of the big messages here I think from what I read from your story here is like when you are interested in something that you believe is it, it is something you're curious about is not to be a hundred percent sure before going in and letting yourself go go down the rabbit hole <laughs> like mm -hmm. with you I love that whole idea of uh, letting yourself get lost in Japan and just go and see 50 houses that you don't know why you're seeing it, but you're here, you might as well put yourself out there. And then by happy stands or accident, however we want to call it, you end up meeting this couple and but because you're in the vicinity of this vision, right? And, and being aligned with particular people or, you know, locations, wherever you're going, that became an, an opportunity, right? And each of these opportunities yeah. weren't the last ones, right? It's sort of built from there and, and so forth, right? Exactly, exactly. And you know, and it took me a while to understand, but a lot of like the, one of the keys was saying yes, because opportunities mm. present themselves to you all the time. Like I have so many friends that are working in different firms and when they like when they have clients approaching them to do their own projects, to do like things separately from the firm, they're like, yeah, I don't feel I'm ready. I don't feel like I could like you have to say yes. You'll never learn if you just think that like we're never ready. We have mm -hmm. to kind of like go into things and just learn as we go. Um, and I was very lucky to have like amazing clients that kind of brainstormed with me and, and made me feel so comfortable about, you know, not knowing exactly what the regulations are. And then I learned I have to collaborate with local architects and I kind of like developed the method uh, that actually when you think about it, it's the same method as all the big architecture firms are using, right? They do, they do the concept and then they take a local 
firm and collaborate and they take care of the bureaucracy and they take care of the yes. design. It's like, oh, this is what I do. But I'm just, you know, me, like I have a team now, but when I started, it was just me. And it mm. made perfect sense because then I can move around. I can just design the concept and, and keep going because the one thing I knew is that I don't want to be stuck in one place for years. Like I want to, like now that I have this freedom, I want to I explore, I want to be in many, many places. Um, so yeah, I think you kind of have to, in a way, uh, decide what the lifestyle you want to have and then build your work life mm. around it because otherwise you, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to maintain it or to enjoy it if it's not something that you want to live long term. I'm so glad you said that because a lot of times we've been taught in the traditional nine to five world is to adapt our lives to the work, right? Like if you need to go into the office and be in commutes for two hours a day, that's just what you do <laughs> to get a job and feel secure. Right. And I think the the message here is about, well, we are living in a different time than our parents, than what was the olden days way of careers. Uh, we're much more into um, exploration, portfolio careers, having multiple careers, actually, in our lifetime. Uh, and it's yeah. and it's help and, and, you know, and, and embracing that. And that's OK as well. Right. But an important part of what you said there is that instead like go right from the get-go even before you understand what that business is or what you where you're heading is just to even have this promise to yourself that if my lifestyle and my values and the way I want to live my life is important to me then I need to commit to um, and, and desire and willingness to find what fits to that lifestyle, right? Adapt my work to fit to my lifestyle. And the way that I saw that you've done it is that you've you've said, I don't want to do the bureaucracy part. I don't want to deal with the on the ground stuff, right? Which is boundaries, yeah. <laughs> right? Which yeah. is like, here's all the work I can do. And I had to do that when I was in my corporate office. But now that I'm independent, I might choose my piece. And my piece is just the concept. My piece is actually I go around the world finding inspiration for my designs and then using that as a feature almost for my my business and bringing that to um, specific target markets that are more my my cup of tea, like digital nomads, expats and uh, global citizens. And then there's no argument <laughs> where I need to be because they would actually like that I travel. They wouldn't prevent me from doing that. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I love that. Like they hire me because I'm a nomad, not in spite of being a nomad, Ex which is incredible. exactly. I really, yeah. really love that because that that to me is um, you're you're creating that opportunity for yourself rather than saying I'm just going to build for anyone who wants a home. But instead, yeah. I'm actually finding aligned soulmate clients that actually share values, right? That are close to mine, which makes jo it more joyful, right, to work with people like that. Oh yeah. My clients are amazing. Like most of my clients are, are amazing, inspiring people um, that mm. I, I absolutely enjoy working with. And I want to say one more thing about like the, um, you know, about the lifestyle thing. Uh, growing up, we were presenting with this one script of how to live. You know, you have to work during the day, sleep during the night. You have to do this and that. You have to have a mortgage and three kids and a dog and I don't know, whatever. And it just feels like when you take yourself out of the context, you can really rethink your values, your lifestyle, your focus hours. Mm. I work best at night, you know? I love working into the night. So if I will try and force myself to sit in front of a desk in 8 a.m., that will not be a successful day for me. I need, you know, when I wake up, I do my yoga. And if I'm like, when I'm traveling, I just go explore and, you know, just like get lost in new streets and, and learn new things about the culture, go to museums or just explore around. And then in the afternoon, that's when I'm really focused. So that's when I mm. sit and do like quality work, like deep work. And it took me a while to understand that, that, you know, that path for me, that, you know, focus hours and, and productivity methods that are working for me. And I think it's something that now when, you know, because of the pandemic, so many people are working from home. So many people are given this new freedom, or as I like to call it, the new movement, because when you have the freedom to work from everywhere, you start to dig deep and ask those questions like, okay, what, what are the best times during the day that I should do my work? Where should I live? You know, so many people are living in cities because this is where work is. But now when work is no longer in the city, where do you choose to live? 
and where do you is, want to live? <laughs> That's yeah, what conducive to your lifestyle. Yeah. And why? Absolutely. And why? So is it community? Do you want to be closer to nature that, like you living in this beautiful tropical island? Um, where do you want to go? And who are the people you surround yourself with? Who are your community of choice? Mm. That actually, this is how we, we grow. This is how we, we shape our lives according to like having people around us that are inspiring. Like I met so many people that inspired me to live my life the way I, I do. Mm. Um, just because I learned of so many ways to live. And I almost felt like I was, you know, it, it was almost misleading thinking that life has only one way of doing it. When mm. actually there's so many and, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and there's one and not every pass is for everybody. Right. I, I think whenever sometimes people think about uh, even just the term digital nomad, um, I, I don't live like most digital nomads. I have a base. I stay in a place. I'm not that nomadic, actually. <laughs> um, I, I like having the flexibility that there are seasons in my life. There's been seasons where I did travel a lot. And then there's seasons that I wanted to get grounded because I was building a project. I needed familiarity. I needed routines. And that felt yeah. right at that moment in time. And then when that stopped, I went, okay, I'm getting the itchy, itchy palms or itchy feet again. Um, I yeah. have that flexibility to travel. I think the whole point is that digital nomadism is not about not having a home if you want to have a home, right? And and having the space you need, but it's more just about um, the notion of having choices, right? And choices that allow you to live in those seasons of your life, whether you have children or you're single or you're starting to have a family that you can change when you work, how you work and from where and with whom in, in, a, in a way that aligns, right? With your strengths, your values uh, and your personality. What I really call your genius zone, right? Your, your best joyful way of working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just tuning in. This is it, you know, tune in, find like whatever works for you and, and play with it, you know, experiment with it. I know that like at some point, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a slow man. I like, <clears throat> I like to travel slow, but- Yeah, me too. You know, <clears throat> it's just that, if you're if you're not gonna ask yourself these questions, nobody will. Yeah, it's just about tuning in and choosing. Yeah, I want to have no base. No, I want to have a base. You know, ideally, I would have three bases, and move with the seasons, or not. You know. Yeah. Just ask yourself, what do you wanna? How how would you like your life to look like? Because if you can't imagine it, then clearly you can't pursue it. Mm. It starts with. Have yeah. An intention. First, believing yeah. it first, it, you, it is possible. And then you and know that as Marie Forleo says, everything's figure outable. You can figure it out, but just want, like, give it. yourself permission to want it. I think that was one of my things that I learned from my parents is like, oh, unless if someone else did it, then you're not allowed to do that. Right. And so I had to reframe my mindset to go, I, I'm allowed to have that thing, even if I don't know how to get to that thing, or if I can have it now, or what I need to do yeah. to get there. Um, I need to let myself dream and let myself think about things that no longer, that don't no not currently existing at the moment, and then allow my brain to seek out solutions, seek out people I need to talk to get help, right? To go, I want there, how do I get there? Uh, but that I yeah. think, you know, we always think we have to have all the answers first to start moving when actually it takes imperfect action to formulate the clarity that we need, right? For the future of our yeah. lives. Mm, yeah, I really love exactly. that. Yeah, now, I want to ask you a question that I know everyone always wants to ask when it comes to these interviews of, you know, me interviewing people with unconventional careers, uh, is that <laughs> okay. all of this sounds great about your lifestyle, about your business. But one of the really confusing things for a lot of people uh, is how, how to run a business not being in a specific location. Because when we think about traditional business, um, we think about, well, our clients come from those communities, those neighborhoods, that district, that state, that city. Um, what, what they always want to know how do you get clients traveling all over the world is it that you're a digital marketer because you know people are like do i need to learn internet skills to the point where i'm a digital marketer to be able to market myself like what has been like your best way of connecting with great clients sharing your work and getting people globally to know what you do great question um okay so the first clients i randomly met them in cafes right. in uh, in parties and uh, like my first client ever when I was back when I was a student uh, we met in an elevator <laughs> so my advice is always <laughs> which is funny <laughs> my advice is always uh, go out and talk to strangers 
go out of your comfort zone, talk to people that you don't normally talk to and just, you know, be open. And funny enough, this is also the name of my podcast. Which That's is right. Go out How to talk, get, to talk to people. I love that name. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, because you know, um, and that's another way of uh, nowadays that people get to know me and my work and we connect through my guests and through my, just people that are, it's interesting for them. So what I do, I host, uh, I interview founders of like amazing projects around the world and I ask them, okay, so what happened? You know, you had this idea and then what happened and then what was the challenges and what, like looking back, what would you do differently and what advice can you give to someone? Because it feels like there isn't a lot of, of knowledge of how to do this you know like okay i want to start a, a hotel in in thailand it's like okay like now what do you do and then now what do you do and like um and now and uh, i just published the second season so it talks about about generating impact you know because we we don't want to be a part of this privileged bubble right we want to be connecting with the culture we're in we want to be have an exchange that is meaningful and not only live our privileged privileged uh lives um, so yeah, meeting people, podcast, um, and just like, I get so many emails from people that I know that's the wonderful thing about the internet. You just upload something and, and you never know who's going to watch it and from where, and it's, it's really amazing. And every time mm. I get an email or a text message on Instagram, I'm just, I'm so, it's so surprising and yeah, yeah, I, I'm very grateful for internet and the ability to connect with random people globally well that's how we met <laughs> through, yeah. well, through a friend you know it's always through people I think I think it's so important I love what you said about going out there and meeting people and also curating your own community curating the people that inspire you to do the things that you dream to do even if it's not the people you grew up with 15 years ago you know I have friends that are in Vancouver that I love dearly you know that will always be my sisters you know and I see and they have a different purpose in my life you know and then I have different friends that are for different versions of my life which is more on this side of the world and you know unconventional ways to raise families and all this stuff that I can probably never talk about as much with uh, my more traditional friends, but they all serve a purpose. And when we have the right curated community, then I think we can do bigger things, you know, and, and we forget that actually marketing, promoting ourselves is always about relationships, <laughs> right? Always about building um, sustainable, um, engaging communities that we both share reasons to be together. And that actually is a funnel. Like that is actually a marketing um, plan in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, like I never once did the whole ad strategy or any, everything has been about sharing interviews like this, right? Um, posting yeah. things um, that I want to share value in every week. And that's trickle by trickle, they become a bigger list of people, a bigger audience that we build along the way. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that part. Um, sure. I want to learn about what's next. So you've got, so you have been a digital nomad or a nomadic architect for how many years now? Um, three and a half. Three and a half yeah. years. Congratulations. <laughs> you've, you've, to, the first two years is always the hump, isn't it? So you've got through the hard days and now oh, yeah. doing a little bit, being more clear about what direction you're, you're heading. Um, so you've got, you, you've been a nomad, nomadic arti architect for three and a half years. You started this season two of your podcast, How to Talk to Strangers, which is so awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And then what's, what is next for you? Because I assume that as you've been, you, you're such a self-aware person and you have that creativity muscle to grow yourself um at at any given time has your work evolved into something of a what's next what are you what are you kind of excited about in the next chapter of um your business oh so many things <laughs> so i'm I, like i'm really excited about you know my projects that i have at the moment i have one project in portugal another one in israel and i'm designing an echo lodge in the desert which mm. is awesome and I'm, I'm just, I, I can't get enough of this project. It's so much fun. But, you know, I always, like, one of the things that I do that I always, let's say, sell my skills for money, right? That's, like, the equation of being a, an independent uh, freelancer, whatever, having my own studio. And I, I always, like, wanted to have my own brand. Uh, and one of the things that I'm most fascinated about are tiny houses, uh, because, you know, as an architect who's living a nomadic lifestyle, I know exactly what you need to have in your tiny house in order to, have, you know, what's the essentials and what's like the experience, because you, you don't live in a tiny house when you want to live in a city, right? You want to do it when you want to connect with nature. And now with the whole pandemic situation, people are really craving 
city escapes. Um, so I'm working on my tiny house brand and it's going to be mostly uh, vacation rentals. Like I don't, like, I know a lot of people don't want to live full time in a tiny house. They just want to have the experience for a week or a month or, you know, go for a retreat. Uh, just try it out. Uh, so this is what I'm working on and I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be really big. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And so many things. <laughs> is there, is there a website that you have already for the tiny house projects or is that an up and coming project for you? No, it's up and coming. I'm thinking still about like what the, what's the best strategy? Uh, because mm -hmm. I, I'll probably won't sell like, like individual units. I'll probably right. do tiny right. house villages and then I'll, yeah. Mm. I have, I have no well, community is such a backbone of your values, right? So I can oh, yeah. imagine that it's not just going to be just sort of container homes that you ship over and everyone has the same duplicated home. That is actually about building an experience because that's, again, your brand promise there uh, that allows yeah. people to go, well, come in for an experience, not just to stay for a week or two and be alone, but integrate yourself with interesting cultures and people and, and, and thinking, new ways of thinking, right? Which is going to encompass yes. so much more of your interest in there. That's so exciting. Now, I don't know if you know, but my partner and I are tiny home fans. Our dreams Ooh. are to actually own a couple of tiny homes in, funny enough, three places in the world, just like you. Our dream is going to be like Canada. So Vancouver, which is where we're from, uh, Bali, which is always my first love of a home base, and then somewhere in Europe, maybe Portugal, um, that will allow us to have a European um, summer home or a fall home, uh, and then be able to actually rent that out uh, for a secondary income and allow people to experience what it feels like to live minimally, not to live with less, but to live with what's essential, what is meaningful, what belongs there instead of consumption of just more and more things. So that really aligns with our values. That's beautiful. Well, you know where <laughs> Let us know me. if you want us to test out any projects for you. <laughs> I'm actually building one now in Israel, which is mm. really exciting. We the design stage and uh, we're looking for different contractors and yeah. It's not so uh, common here. So people are like, you want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> that's why it might be big, right? Because it's not, again, a conventional, traditional thing to do. No, which are my okay. favorite things. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Out of the status quo. <laughs> Now, I want to yeah. ask you one final question, which is probably the question you're asking your client or your uh, your podcast guests, and I want to turn the lens on you. Um, you ask them, you know, what, like, you you ask them the question about, you know, uh, what would you have, what would you do differently if you were to start again? What are some of the nuggets, not about just being successful and making it, because we hear those stories all the time, right? But if you were to get raw and real <laughs> right now about <laughs> something that you can think about, if you can go back in time, talk to Addy from three and a half years ago, what do you think would have been uh, something that, um, um, yeah, you wish that you could have told her, like either not to worry about something she just couldn't stop worrying about or something that just never, you know, that didn't occur to her that is now happening for you. What would that message be for yeah, Addie yeah. during that transitional period of being a digital or nomadic architect? It's mm, a really good question. Um, <laughs> well, you ask it, so it must be good. <laughs> I guess I would say enjoy the unknown mm. right because the unknown comes with a lot of anxiety and like self-doubt of like what am I, am I going to do with my life and you know I invested so much time and money into this path and now what and I feel so lost and um I guess that would be just you know celebrate it celebrate the unknown mm. just enjoy this adventure I, I have of course like some parts in me that did it but I was so worried for so long for like I don't know what, what I'm gonna do with my life and I guess I I could have saved a lot of energy just yes a bit trusting more but I guess it's part of the process because it's also it is it, yeah when you're, when you're concerned it kind of like pushes you to 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 ask more questions and dig deeper. So, mm. I guess it's seven. but I could have been more relaxed, I guess, yes. in the first days of me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember the one thing when I was asked this question as well on another podcast, and I said, just let go. 
just don't hold on so tight, like until your knuckles are white, you know, like that was what I was doing. Yeah. It's like, ah, like, you know, just going down the roller coaster, like, ah, and I just wish I let go a little bit, but I can still be scared. I'm allowed to be scared. That's a totally normal human emotion when we go through change, not to be afraid of that fear, but just not to just hang on to it because I needed that control because actually part of the journey is letting go and allowing the universe to give you what it is that you need, you know, because it may not be what you might even imagined <laughs> that you actually wanted, but it's actually yeah. what you really needed. So I, I definitely very much resonated with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Enjoy the ride. Yeah, mm, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, okay, well, so thank excited. you so much for having like, you know, being here and us being able to have you here. Now, if people are inspired by what you're doing with your podcast, the projects you're working on, I know you have a really awesome video we're going to share on um, your your page here so when, when people come to the blog uh, to look at your video about why you became a nomadic architect, the awesome, awesome videos of you all around the world. Mm -hmm. But where can where can people get in touch with you if they've been inspired in your story and want and want to connect? with you and find out more about these new exciting projects that you're working on mm -hmm. yeah sure um so um my website is a great place to start uh the new movement uh which is the new mvt.com m amazon mother all... mother vet trailer <laughs> right mvt <laughs> <laughs> mother tiny uh yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, just a shortcut of movement. Um, yeah, the new mvt.com. Um, there you can also find the links to my LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook page. So I think that's the easiest way to connect with me. And if anyone is interested in uh, the podcast, you can find it both of my, my on my website and on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and like all the apps. That's the easiest way. Awesome. We'll put the links up as well for everyone who is watching, whether it's on YouTube or on our blog, uh, come on over to our blog, screwthecubicle.com forward slash blog. You'll find Addy there uh, and we'll be adding all her links, how you contact her and just say hello to her if you've enjoyed this uh, episode. I know that we always love hearing that it, it hit a note for someone that we inspired someone somewhere in the global world today, which is always cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Hopefully one day I get to come to one of your tiny homes in Israel. It's definitely on the list. And maybe one day you can come visit me in Bali where I can help inspire you, your new palette of what tropical tiny home living could look like here with bamboos. <laughs> I'm so tempt you. interested in that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Abby. <laughs>